Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for our session, How to Turn Event Data into Actionable Insights. Uh, we will be taking questions, so please submit these in the event app, and we'll have a question and answer section at the end of the session. Uh, but I'm delighted to welcome David Preston to present this session. Uh, David is, was named recently the most influential CEO in 2023, and is a certified C event partner. Um, so we're looking forward to hearing his insight and jumping into the session. Thank you, David. Thank you. Bright lights, all good fun as well as always. There was a forward-looking statement, nothing I'm going to say will influence the stock price at all, so don't worry about that. Anyway, can we move forward? Yes, as uh, if just mentioned, if you want to download the app, you can actually uh, ask questions, which will be uh, hopefully answered uh, at the end. If not, then we'll find the answer for you. So, yes, I uh, run an organization called Realize. We are a Cvent partner. Um, we spend a lot of time uh, at events like this on behalf of Cvent and their clients. Um, but as apart from all that, then, uh, you know, we have a passion for things to do with data. So here's a sobering thought for you. And I don't know if anybody can actually remember what an extra byte is, but it's a billion gig, uh, gigs of data, okay? So there's a hell of a lot of data. So five extra bytes were, have been created in the world since it began to 2003. The question is, how long do you think it takes to create five extra bytes of data today? Any thoughts? Any suggestions? Every two days. Okay. I'd, said, I'd start off with that perspective, really, to give you the thought that actually we don't not have enough data. Data is not the problem. Okay. Everything we do, every click we make, every point we do with our, you know, our, our on screen, data is generated. So the question of do we have data is not the data is not the question to be asked. It's what do we do with the data. In the world of events, and again, most of you, I'm sure, come, if you're here at Cvent Connect, um, come from the world of events. So there's all of these interactions that we can have with our attendees to gather data. All right, doesn't matter whether it's the online surveys that we do, and a lot of you will be asked to do a survey after this session, as an example. Everybody registered for this event, didn't we all? Yeah, to actually come here today, you had to register. You had to fill in and give us data. So there's all of these areas that we can do so. And in fact, we have a client that we worked with the, um, every year at the moment who actually started off the conversation with us by presenting us with a spreadsheet with 100 columns. Now, you know, one might be horrified by that, but again, what it actually enabled us to do was to build their system knowing what they wanted as an output at the end. Because they said, that's what we need to have all the data. Please help us collect that. So, you know, don't always be afraid when your clients and, or you actually know what your outputs are because it helps you build your inputs in the first place. So, again, in the world of events, plenty of places that we can collect data. So what are we going to talk about a bit today? D plus C equals AI. And I promise you, I'm not going to talk about AI as everybody else is talking about. Okay? Data plus context equals action, you know, actionable insights. That's what I want everybody to take away from today, is if we actually start to actually add some context to the data, we can actually do something about it. I had the privilege a few years ago of running the uh, exhibition program for IBM um, <coughs> globally. And I'll tell you a little bit about a dream I had at the time when I started that, that role, okay, and how we actually become accountable and actually have some insights that we can actually take action from. And uh, uh, secondly, after I left IBM a few years later, then I actually was uh, head of marketing for an internet security company. And I walked into the job, and I'll, again, I'll tell you a little bit about a program that I put in place there to help us make decisions about why we go to events, which ones we go to, and the decision criteria that we actually start to use. So actually, making it actionable rather than just having just data. Okay, so 
any of the marketeers in the room, can't see you all, all the faces, but any of the marketeers in the room will actually understand the, the, the term persona. And a lot of us use personas as a way of defining our ideal target audience. Okay, here we have one here. It's very simple, a man, he's born in 1948, raised in the UK, you know, married twice, lives in a castle, travels with security, and is wealthy and famous. Okay, the persona, in that respect, could be King Charles, yeah? Now, in the world of online dating, as I'm sure many of you do, we swipe right, that same persona could be Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> Two very, very different people, and the conversations you're gonna have with them are gonna be very different, aren't they? Even though their persona is exactly the same. So, again, so let's be careful with how we use data unless you put some context around it. Okay, so again, in the world of uh, social media and stuff, you've been catfished because you got it wrong. Anyway, people, does anybody use heat maps in the world, that, in the work that they do? It's becoming quite, you know, popular, particularly in the world of exhibitions. Exhibition organizers like to be able to uh, show where the traffic was, where you know, the best part of the exhibition hall was, et cetera, et cetera. You know, identifying the hotspots by giving you data. And maybe they'll use tracking mechanisms like RFID and that sort of stuff to give them that data in the first place. Problem with that is, as we've all been, is it just simply the fact that the exhibition stand over there had the best giveaways? Maybe nothing to do with the content of what they were trying to sell you, but maybe, you know, how many of you have been to an exhibition and you stood listening to or watching the card magician? Yeah? Somebody thought it was a good idea because it was going to bring people to their stand. Nothing to do with their content. Okay? So if you relied on the heat map data, you'd think that I should have a stand in that particular part of the exhibition hall. No, because there's no context behind that data. It's just data. So little cautionary tale here, and again, from personal experience, we've all done it. A pint of milk, or in today's modern terms, a litre of milk, okay? I go to my little local co-op every other day, buy my litre of milk. I go in there one day, and the milk is always the third aisle and the second row back. Not today. The supermarket, in its, in its infinite wisdom, has decided to move things around in the supermarket in the hope that I'm going to walk past something else and go, oh, I didn't realize I needed bread, but I'll have it while I'm here. I didn't know I needed cabbage cream eggs, but I'll have them while I'm here. That's what they hope, okay? And if they were to measure me, I've suddenly spent not just two minutes in the store, but now five minutes in the store. They think they've done a great job because they've increased my dwell time in their store. Reality is, I'm a pissed off customer because I can't find the milk. Yeah? And all, I've, all they've actually done is actually turn me off going back to buying my milk there because I can't find it. And if they're going to do that repetitively, then I'll never go back there again. So just be careful with, again, with the data that their people collect without knowing the context of what they, how to apply it. Anybody go to IMEX this year over in Frankfurt? A few people, a few hands going up. And some of you, if you've been fortunate enough, they had a very successful IMAX in Las Vegas a couple of weeks' time. So the one in Frankfurt earlier on this year, the exhibition organizer publishes these fantastic statistics. Again, no context about those statistics. So there was 57,000 appointments. Was it just old friends getting together because they hadn't seen each other because of lockdown and all that sort of stuff in the previous years? Who knows? But they registered 57,000 appointments, yeah? So they had 2,900 exhi exhibiting companies. Yeah, that's great. For selling your space, that's absolutely what you want to know. Again, did they do any business? We have no idea. So with all these stats and things, they are good for the exhibition organizer, perhaps, in promoting their business to other people but they're not actually telling the story about what actually happened at the event. 
And did anybody actually do any business by going to the exhibition? You know, I said to even the Seabank guys earlier on today, you know, how many leads do you expect to get from this event? Somebody said, well, you know, well, we don't really collect leads. It's about relationships, which may be the right objective for your event. But I would hope that they are actually collecting leads and people will actually do some business because of coming to see them and connect. So, again, just make sure that whenever you look at these things, that the data that you've got has got some context behind it so you know what to do with it. So, tell you a little bit about this dream I had and in the famous words of Martin Luther King, you know, I had a dream and some days you have to dream big when you have a big problem. At IBM, and as I say, this was a few years ago and I'm sure the numbers are, have changed along the way, but we were doing 2,000 exhibitions around the world every year. We were spending $300 million dollars on doing exhibitions every year. Now that's a big number in anyone's book. Even if you are an IBM, a $100 billion business, yeah, it's still a big number. The question was, which ones work and which ones don't? And when I joined the events team over there, that was the problem. We didn't know which ones were working and which ones weren't. So, anybody do lead scoring when they you know, go to an exhibition and, or experience the salesperson scoring them as a lead in terms of asking you questions about what it is you actually want to buy. Yeah, I'm sure, you know, I can't see everybody nodding or not, in the, unfortunately, because of the lights. Anyway, we all remember the days of gathering leads at an exhibition was the fishbowl on the side and we collected the business cards, didn't we? Yeah. And then we took them back to the office and we had one of the admin team put them into the CRM system. And Amelia, the red card there, would get a call from a sales guy because she dropped her card in the fishbowl. No context as to what Amelia wants, what product she was interested in, or why she was even at the show. She's just a name that a, a sales guy has. You need to call Amelia. She's dropped her card in the fishbowl. So what we did was to create what we called in those days, BANT. Okay, a way to categorize a lead so that we actually knew, was it, was it worth it at all? Simple things. Does the person standing in front of you have any budget? Because if you're a sales guy and you're talking to somebody who's only budget, you're not going to sell anything. Do they have the authority to spend that budget? Or are they actually just on a fact-finding mission? Because there's a lot of us who's job it is to actually go out and find products, but we actually don't have the authority to spend any money. Is there actually a project or a need you know, on the horizon? Or again, are they just in a fact-finding mission? No, fact-finding missions are good, but if you're a sales guy, you want to sell something. So lastly then is the timing. When is this? Is this the next couple of weeks, or are we talking 2025? Now, you put those four things together and you can start to come up with a lead scoring. Which, if you can imagine, like today, in, you know, upstairs in the in Innovation Pavilion, they may end up with, I don't know, 4,000 leads. How do they then, as a company, decide which ones they ought to do first, you know, talk to the person first? By giving it an aggregate score, they got some chance of prioritizing which lead they should work on. And again, by looking at this, the actual band weighting, you can go, okay, this person has decent budget, they're allowed to spend it, they have a project, and it's in the next three months. Probably you ought to get on the phone to them, shouldn't I? Against the person who has a, has a budget, doesn't actually have a project, and anyway, they're just thinking about signing for 2025. They could probably wait for a couple of weeks. So the dream was fundamentally to have a map of the world that aggregated the leads per event to an aggregate score. Okay, so you could see across the world all the different events that were going on. So that's great. And again, individual leads, you have some context around those leads. But here as an event manager, if you're actually managing a whole program, you could be sitting there and going, hang on a minute. 
I wonder what was going on in Italy. Or conversely, what were they doing well in Tokyo? Or in Stockholm? Yeah? And look at that, and it may, the answer may simply be, when you look at the, the band scoring of all the leads you've got, that all the people in Italy were not decision makers. They were there just trying to gather information and data you know, for the products that you sell, which may be absolutely right, but it doesn't give you, you know, without the context, it doesn't give you any idea about what, whether you should do Italy again, or how can we do more Tokyos? using the same principles that we're doing there. So that was the dream, that's what we were trying to do. Um, so this became the way that we actually made decisions to invest and disinvest for the products that we were going to uh, participate in. Now Sievent has this wonderful uh, chart, and some of you may have seen it in other presentations over the last couple of days, um, about all the different points. It comes back to one of the earlier charts that I showed you all the different places we can gather data. And they come up with um, what they call an engagement score. And the engagement score, again, is just an indicator. It has no real context. So, you know, I might get a point, one point, or 10 points because I registered online. Yeah, I might get a few points because I accepted some appointments. So it gives us a score and it might say to me how much I've interacted with the platform and with Cvent, but it doesn't give me any context as to what I want as an individual going forward. And interestingly, they did a survey back in 2022, actually, just looking at my notes here, um, with Forrester, one of the big analyst companies. And what the, one of the things that particularly came out of that that I, I looked at, it says only 29% are capturing data at more than one stage of an event journey, which seems a bit strange. Are they just relying on registration data as a way of following up with their customers? Seems a bit sort of naive to think, but perhaps that's what it is. So only 29% of people in the survey of 2,000 people, senior marketers, were actually capturing data throughout that whole journey. So what does that mean? If I just rely on that registration data, I'm going to have simple, you know, profile data about me, aren't you? My name, my company I work for, the job title I have. You might have a bit of information about my industry that I work for and those sorts of things. It's not a very good follow-up conversation for a sales guy to have with me as a lead that says, Hi, David, you went to our event. Great that you came. What do you want? You know, it's not a good conversation, is it? You know, because you don't know anything about why I was there, what I was doing, and what context um, I have. So if I think about that and have a jolly little face that says, okay, I do know that you attended the keynote speech. I do know that you attended three sessions. But I noticed within that you only stayed for five minutes in one of them. Probably means you weren't interested in it once you got in there. Okay? You had some one-to-one -one meeting, great, fantastic. And you visited six of our 25 product booths. Again, fantastic, starting to build up a picture of David and what I did. The question now is, just imagine that conversation the sales guy can have with me as a prospect. It says, so David, what was the most interesting part of the keynote speech that you listened to? Was there anything particular that you'd like to know more about? Oh, and David, you went to three sessions those sessions, did you get what you're looking for? Can we set up a further product demonstration for you? So again, just thinking this is putting some context around the data that enables a, in sales term, a consultative selling approach rather than you know, selling product just because of selling product. Okay? You're really understanding what the customer has actually has been doing and therefore looking at. So we can combine that with the lead data that you've got from those five or six product demonstrations that I've been to, you really have a great picture about what David Preston did when he came to see Event Connect and what the salesperson should be doing with me next. Okay, moving on. So often people say to me, well, that's great, I, I like all what you've been talking about, but how do I make the change? How do I get the salespeople 
to understand BANT? How do I actually put the context around the data and actually start to use it on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, this second uh, sort of case study I'll, I'll share with you, as I say, was I was head of marketing for an internet security company. Some of you may have heard of them. They're called Kaspersky Lab. They're Russian. So the first thing to note was money was not the issue. Okay? They're Russian. I'll just put that. They're Russian. Money was not the issue. Okay? But when I joined the business, and some of you may well have been to or heard of Gartner and their symposiums that they have around the world, okay? The first thing I looked at was we were spending $100,000 to buy the floor space to attend that conference. Seems like a lot of money in anyone's books. But we had no way of actually saying whether that was good value for money or not. And I say, regardless of whether you've got lots of money in your back pocket, you have a fiduciary, you know, ex expectation as a head of marketing to be spending whatever budget you've got wisely. And therefore, we had to correct that situation. The other part to it was, I had no idea whether the people we actually needed to talk to were actually in the same room as us. Yeah? Were the target audience that we wanted to speak to, that's why we had the stand in the first place, actually attending the conference? We didn't know. So imagine those two things together and a sort of thing that does keep you up at night. So what did we do? First thing we had to do was to train the sales reps. In fact, uh, Richard, my business partner, uh, had realized that's where we first met. I engaged a team to run around Europe and train salespeople on what using uh, lead qualification criteria would mean to them and their business and what they do. So we, you know, we designed a, 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 a boot camp, we called it, and no sales guy or, put, or lady was allowed to go and stand on a, a, a Kaspersky exhibition booth unless they'd attended the boot camp and qualified, by the way. Okay, which was understanding why should I not just scan somebody's badge, but ask them some meaningful questions to understand whether they are a lead or not. There's so many people, what do they call them? Tire kickers, aren't they? Where they go around exhibition halls and things and just to shake the tree, or whatever, to see what falls out, but they're actually not there to buy anything. So we did that. We happened to be, you might have seen from the previous picture, there's me in front of a Ferrari race car, Formula One car. So we had a sponsorship with them. So we used that sort of team spirit, how to work together, that sort of thing, to actually build this training program. As I say, the key thing was for me, they had to pass to be able to qualify to attend an exhibition. Because otherwise, sales guys would just turn up. And we've all seen them, haven't they? Yeah? Oh, you want to talk to me? No, sorry, I've got an email I've got to finish for a client that is not here today, you know? We've all been there. We've all seen it. So we taught them how to behave properly as much as what it actually meant to qualify a lead. So what did that do for us? It suddenly instantly gave me, as the, the head of marketing, a qualification uh, you know, criteria and therefore some numbers that told me how much value in, in the leads we were generating. So hence a return on investment that we could actually say was $100,000 just to buy the space, actually going to be good use of our money. The second part, because of that band criteria we're looking at, we actually discovered that the people we wanted to talk to weren't there. Or the people we were talking to weren't the people we wanted to talk to. Okay? Because they didn't have a budget. Or they didn't have actual project needs that they wanted to do. So much to uh, Gartner's disgust, I cancelled next year round. And, you know, fought with them for many, many uh, weeks and months about why and what and, and what they could do to bring me back. But I said, the wrong people are there, and you're charging far too much for what I'm getting out of it as a return on investment. I'm not going to go. So the lessons being learned, as you might say, is you do have to make change. Everybody doesn't understand, you know, about lead qualification. And if you use the CVENT tools, yes, they do have a lead capture product, 
And if you look at the lead capture product, there are qualification criteria already written into the application. You can do it straight away with the Cvent product. Not here just, just to sell Cvent, but there are other products available, as they say. But the point being is if you don't have that mentality of how do I actually qualify leads, how do I actually you know, get some aggregate numbers across all of the leads, I won't be able to work out whether I'm actually spending the right money in the right place at the right time. That's so just to come back then, so data plus context. So all of this journey that you can go on with the Cvent tools to give you engagement score, almost, be, I would dare to say, is meaningless unless you've got some context. So a, a, an engagement score is great. It just shows how much I actually interacted with the platform. But at the end of the day, if I don't have any context, I can have all the data in the world, but it's meaningless. So thank you very much for your time. We have a few moments left for any questions, if anybody has any questions. Is there anything come through on the eye? Questions yes. so far? Yeah, so first one, we don't yet have a lead scoring system in place. Where do you suggest starting? Call David Preston. He'll come and help you with that. No, I think the, the, the key thing is use BANT. It's... It's, you know, it's fairly uh, standard. It's nothing proprietary to anybody or anything. Use that as a place to start, okay? Next one is, how do you get consensus on what data you should capture so that all stakeholders are on the same page? Uh, uh, and that is, that is a journey you have to go on because there are so many stakeholders in any event. But it, 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 the key thing is to have a common language things like start to use BANT with each one of the lines of business that you're working with, so everybody's working off the same set of tools and the same methodology. And then you become the hero because you can put it all together and say, this is the value that this event brought to our business because of all the leads that we were able to generate. Okay. Um, next question, what would you suggest as the most important data points to capture? Depends on your objectives. Always depends on your objectives. You know, Richard and I and Carol are going to an event tonight. The objective is to actually to have fun. Okay, there isn't a business objective there. So it depends on the objectives of, of what the event are. If the event objectives are to generate leads, like C Event Connect, we're out here, then you've got to focus on the things that are where the data is that's going to give you how much business are we generated because of this event. How much did you use data from outside the event in connection with the event data at IBM and Kaspersky? And how important was that? To be perfectly frank with you, especially the IBM days, we didn't have social media in those days. Because, you know, this was back in sort of the, uh, the, the early noughties, as they say. So there wasn't the... the uh, proliferation of social media and stuff like that. But most of what we're doing is just trying to get the sales team on the same page as to how to evaluate an event. I say, just to go back to that point, $300 million on trade shows. In any company's books, that's a lot of cash. In fact, even to the point, at one point, I said, let's just stop doing trade shows for a year and save $300 million. And then everybody says, no, 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 but we've captured lots of leads, don't we? And we go, yes, of course we do. So let's all get on the same page about how we capture and measure leads so that we can really justify spending $300 million on events. Um, that's all the questions in the app. We've got one minute remain, remaining. Uh, any other questions from the room? Go on. Exactly. No, and it's a very good question. And that we've always been is the stock answer, from usually from sales. The, the response has to be, show me the business value from the past, and then we'll have a conversation. But because they couldn't, because they had no measurement that was common that they could actually you know, pull out of the drawer and say, yeah, for the last three years we did you know, $100 million worth of business, it was an easy conversation at the end of the day. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for listening.